animations, along with further video content, can be accessed via the official World Meeting of Families 2018 website. It is my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Archbishop Eamon Martin, Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of All-Ireland. Archbishop Eamon Martin was born in Derry in 1961. He was ordained a priest in June 1987 and was appointed chaplain to His Holiness in November 2010. In September 2014, it was announced that His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI had appointed Monsignor Eamon Martin as Archbishop of Armagh. He is president of the Irish Episcopal Conference and is co-chair of the Council for Marriage and the Family of the Irish Episcopal Conference. In a recent address, Archbishop Martin said, it is in the family that we are first loved and where we first learn to love. It is in the family that we discover who we are, where we have come from, our links with the place, with the land and a worshipping community. I invite you to join me in welcoming Archbishop Eamon Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, everyone. The joy of love, a joy for all God's family. The joy of love, transcending time and space. Our love for each other mirrors God the Father's love. The joy of love, a joy for all the earth. You sound good. <laughs> Recently, someone sent me a collection of old prayers called Circle Prayers. I don't know if you know any, but apparently they were very popular in Celtic countries like Ireland. Circle Prayers ask God to surround us with love and protection. One beautiful prayer goes like this. Circle me, Lord. Keep protection near and danger afar. Circle me, Lord. Keep light near and darkness afar. Circle me, Lord. Keep peace within. Keep evil out. Circle me, Lord. Keep hope within. Keep doubt without. You know, one of the most beautiful circle prayers is the one that we call St. Patrick's breastplate. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ all around me. I remember teaching it to a primary school class once, and one little boy said, it's like a force field. And he was dead right. This idea that when we are in need or sad or ill or lonely, God surrounds us with love and care and protection. I've always liked the term family circle. For me, it captures that sense of unique closeness and connection which family represents. Here at the World Meeting of the Families, we celebrate the good news of the family, which is joy for the world. And this afternoon, I'd like to explore how the family circle of love and prayer and trust and care is so important for the church, for society, and for the whole world. And even though we all know that sometimes relationships in families don't work out, we still hold that circle of relationships within the family grandparents, parents, children, siblings, grandchildren, we still hold that as something unique and special. My dear mother died just five months ago at the age of 90, God rest her. 
And one of the most moving and special moments for me at that time was when we gathered as a family circling her bedside and shared her last Eucharist. It was very moving for me to touch the sacred host to her lips and place a tiny drop of the precious blood on her tongue. The body of Christ, I said. The blood of Christ. It was a moment of communion, of intimacy and tenderness in our family. As if we were returning to my mother some of the love and tenderness which she had shared with us growing up. But above all, to be with her in prayer. It was the least we could do for this beautiful, strong woman who had handed on the faith to us and who had always prayed for us, her six sons and six daughters. Mama lived the faith by the example of her prayer. She showed us, she showed us what it was like to have a deep friendship with the Lord. She gave us powerful witness when things weren't going so well in times of trouble and suffering. And she helped us to offer every moment to God. Among my earliest memories is of my mother lining us up in the kitchen before school to comb our hair. We were like steps of stairs. And one by one, as she combed and brushed, she prayed with us the morning offering. Oh my God, she said, I give to you all I think and say and do, all my work and happy play I will give to God today. So these days, whenever I think about living and handing on the faith, I think of my mother and father wrapping us around in a circle of faith and love and service and tenderness. We often describe God's fatherly love for us, but don't we sometimes forget that God's tender loving kindness is also like the love of a mother, which is there for us no matter what, despite our mistakes and our sinfulness. And together, the tender love of father and mother in the family, circling their children around with warmth and safety and teaching and learning and mercy and forgiveness and freedom and responsibility and charity and generosity. Together, this generates and nourishes the first and vital cell of church and society, which is the family. Pope Francis speaks about a revolution of tenderness in today's world one which will melt the hardness of heart that is so prevalent nowadays. Hardness of heart. We see it so much in the violence, greed, destruction of property, defamation of character, vengeance, hatred that is in the world. Instead, Pope Francis says we need a revolution of tenderness fostered and nourished in the family circle, which challenges us to show sensitivity and concern for everything and everyone, and to protect the wonder of life in our common home. And since, as Pope Francis puts it, everything is connected, this includes the way we care for the environment, how we welcome and accept refugees, the elderly, the unborn, the forgotten, the abandoned, how we acknowledge the worth of a poor person, a human embryo, a person with disabilities. You can read all about this idea of interconnectedness in Laudato Si. So the family is like a school for humanity. And as you know, the family is the little church, the domestic church. Because it's in the family that values are transmitted, the wisdom of generations is passed on, the choices between right and wrong are evaluated and weighed up, connections with the past are made, links with other families are forged, and it is in the family that we are first loved 
and where we first learn to love. It's in the family that we discover who we are, where we've come from, our intergenerational relationships, our links with a place, with the land, with a city, and of course, with a worshiping community. Family is all about connection. Family connects us to a home, to the people who are our flesh and blood, but it also connects us to a community, to a parish, to a county. Ask the people from Tyrone or Dublin. <laughs> Family connects us to a parish, to a history and a culture, to a language and tradition, to our past, present, and future. For believers, of course, family connects us to faith and values, to baptism and to a worshiping community. And so that first vital cell that is the immediate family circle multiplies and divides and multiplies again and connects us to a much larger family, a family of families that is the church and that is society. Listen to these beautiful words of Pope St. John Paul II, where he reflects on family. He says, The family is the domestic church. The meaning of this traditional Christian idea is that the home is the church in miniature. The church is the sacrament of God's love. She is a communion of faith and life, she is a mother and a teacher. She is at the service of the whole human family as it goes forward towards its ultimate destiny. In the same way, the family, Pope John Paul says, is a community of life and love. It educates and leads its members towards their full human maturity, and it serves the good of all along the road of life. The family, he says, is the first and vital cell of society. In its own way, it is a living image and historical representation of the mystery of the church. The future of the world and the future of the church passes through the family. My brothers and sisters, in the family we also discover how we can connect with society and how each one of us can bring our personal gifts to serving the common good and the well-being of all humanity. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it like this. The family is the original cell of social life. It is the natural society in which husband and wife are called to give themselves in love and in the gift of love. Family life, the Catechism says, is an initiation into life in society. During this world meeting of the families, we'll be reflecting and communicating and distilling for our times this beautiful and prophetic vision of God's plan for marriage and the family. Of course, this good news, the gospel of the family, has its origins in the creation of humanity in the image of God, who is love. Amoris Laetitia traces the gospel of the family from sacred scripture to church tradition and the teachings of the magisterium. I particularly like the way Pope Francis reminds us how God chose to save us. How did he do it? He did it by sending his son into the world, into a human family, which was open to receiving him in love. We believe that the church's proclamation of the family, founded on that circle of faithful loving between a woman and a man, which is open to the gift of children who are the fruit of that love, we see this as good news for society and for the world. 
Look, there's no getting away from the fact, however, that communicating the family in this way can appear increasingly countercultural in many parts of the world, including Ireland. And this has been accelerated, I think, by the departure in public discourse from the philosophical and anthropological underpinning of marriage and the family in natural law, and by the erosion of social supports for traditional marriage in the form of constitutional guarantees or positive legislation. In presenting God's plan for marriage and the family, which includes God's plan for the transmission of life itself, the church can sometimes be accused of being exclusive or lacking in compassion. How difficult it must be for young people today to make sense of all the contradictory messages that are presented to them in the world. They're easily drawn towards an overly emotional and romantic concept of love and marriage, which Pope Francis has observed can be constructed and modified at will. Marriage and having children. Employers will often expect them to be flexible, movable, able to travel and work long on social hours. With regard to the transmission of life, our young people are surrounded by a contraceptive, anti-birth mentality with increasing indifference to abortion. And then later, whenever they do earnestly desire to have children, they struggle with a technocratic commodification of childbearing, which if necessary can be accessed independently of any sexual relationship. Into this complicated, topsy-turvy world, we have the joy and the challenge of communicating a clear and positive vision of family and marriage. The good news that human life is sacred. Each human being comes from God who created us, male and female that we are all willed by God who loves each and every one of us, that self-giving love and commitment in the marriage of a man and a woman open to life is not only possible, but is a beautiful and fulfilling gift with the power of God's grace, that chastity is achievable, healthy and good for our young people, that giving yourself in marriage to another person for life is a special, rewarding, and wonderful symbol of Christ's forgiving, faithful love for his church. We proclaim this gospel of the family because we believe in it, and we also firmly hope that with the help of God, it is attainable. Of course, it is one thing to have a joyful message to proclaim and propose. It's quite another to find effective ways of communicating this message. If no one is listening, it's difficult to communicate. The task of proclaiming the gospel of the family in the church belongs to all of us because it is most effectively communicated from cell to cell, from family to family, witnessing intentionally and courageously and by lived example to the church's vision. Together, therefore, we proclaim the gospel of the family because we are convinced that the welfare of the family is decisive for the future of the world. Or, as Pope St. John Paul II loved to put it, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. Three years ago, 
I had the privilege of attending the Synod on the Family in Rome. It was very moving to hear the bishops as shepherds of the church describing their hopes and anxieties that face their flocks, the families of the world. We heard passionate first-hand accounts of forced migration, persecution and war. We were shocked by the extent of human trafficking, the exploitation and commodification of women and children. We heard about wounds for hire, about child soldiers, forced prostitution, and the exploitation of street children in large cities. We shuddered at the prevalence of abuse and domestic violence. We considered the challenges presented by some cultures regarding polygamy, arranged marriages, mixed and interfaith marriages. We spoke about the pressures on family life from individualism, isolation, and the spread of abortion, euthanasia, and gender ideology. We faced the reality that in many countries, the majority of marriages take place without any reference to faith or to God. At the same time, however, we shared our tremendous admiration and gratitude for the many families who do their best in complex situations to persevere, to grow in love, and to generously witness to commitment, forgiveness, and lifelong faithfulness. The overwhelming sense among the bishops at the Synod I found was a desire to be with all families, and especially with those whose homes are visited by tragedy and violence, and those who, for whatever reason, have experienced breakdown in their relationships, and those who may feel excluded from the church for this reason or for other reasons. The synods and Amoris Laetitia were clear that we all need to be mindful of those who have begun new relationships and unions. We have to try to find sincere and truthful ways of welcoming and including them in the life and worshiping community of the church. This world meeting of the families provides us with another opportunity to propose ways of accompanying families in these and other difficult situations, including developing a ministry of care for those whose marriage relationships have broken down. Conscious that the Christian message of truth and mercy converges in Christ. At the Synod, I really sensed a desire among the bishops of the world to help all God's people find God's plan for them, knowing that no one is excluded from the circle of God's love and that all are included in the church's pastoral activity. So in bringing our message about marriage and the family into the world, we face a challenge of trying to communicate our sincerely held perspectives about family and other matters. Because we do so alongside those of other faiths and those of no faith. We have therefore to encourage conversations at national and international level about the importance of the family. We must also be aware that in the aftermath of the child abuse scandals and other shameful episodes of the past in the church, there are those who feel they can no longer trust our message, maybe because they've been directly hurt and betrayed in their own families by the experience of church, or because the revelations of such heinous crimes by clergy and religious and other church personnel have shocked them to the core. 
Pope Benedict XVI alerted us in Ireland to the fact that the sins and crimes of sexual abuse in the church have not only had tragic consequences in the lives of victims and their families, but they have also obscured the light of the gospel. And for me, that is particularly true about the gospel of the family. But still, if we truly believe the good news that the welfare of the family is decisive to the future of the world, then how can we keep from singing and proclaiming this vital truth? We must work together with all people of goodwill to encourage the state to encourage and support the family, and especially to support the uniqueness of the faithful and exclusive union between a married man and a woman as a cherished space for the bearing and upbringing of children. In doing this, the state is not only caring for its citizens, but it is also strengthening and nurturing the foundations of society itself. As Pope Francis has said, the family deserves special attention by those responsible for the common good because it is the basic unit of society which brings strong links of union that underpin human existence and with the generation and education of children that ensures the renewal and future of society. So taking inspiration from the powerful 1983 Charter of the Rights of the Family, which you can find in Familiaris Consortio, we might discuss with all our public representatives in all our various countries, to what extent does public policy support family and life? To what extent does it support freedom of conscience and education, a proper work-life balance which respects the role of mothers and fathers? What do our economic and social policies say to poorer families, particularly those policies which impact directly on family? And what about the needs of children, the elderly, tackling the proliferation of drugs, alcohol and gambling and other addictive behaviors which can destroy home and family? How do welfare policies and benefit programs support families who are most in need and those who are so easily targeted and exploited by loan sharks and other criminal elements? How can we better assist young people who want to establish a family, mortgage a home, take out insurance, but who may sometimes be convinced by economic policy to remain single. In asking these questions of public policymakers, we're not suggesting that we want the state to overly intrude or to replace the important autonomy of the family. On the contrary, we do so because we believe that if the institution of the family is harmed, then all society suffers. As the vital circle and community of love and support in society, the family is much more than an economic or social unit. It is a privileged space, a space for care, education, health promotion, mediation, security, community cohesion and safety. When the family is neglected by society, social problems multiply and become increasingly more complex. It would be a mistake to neglect the importance of the family in favor of some kind of society of ones. You know what I mean. Founded upon the undisputed supremacy of the pure individual. To replace we with me. Again, on the contrary, individuals thrive best 
when they have the nourishment, primary support, and wraparound care of the family. All those simple, everyday gestures that we get in a family of love and trust and gratitude and concern and forgiveness and healing, all of these which are part and parcel of family life help society because they help to create stability and the solidarity on which society depends. In entering a dialogue between the church and the state on the importance of family, we're very conscious, of course, that our pastoral experience shows us that family relationships do not always work out. At times, they require the direct intervention for the safety and well-being of family members. We also have to be cautious about thinking that people who disagree with us on the issue of family are necessarily hostile to us. They're not always. The engagement of people of faith, together with all people of goodwill, in conversations about family, marriage, and other critical life matters, is to be encouraged and welcomed. In the Catholic Church, of course, in these conversations, we will draw upon a rich tradition of social and moral teaching, which will sometimes bring uncomfortable questions into such a dialogue. However, in an atmosphere of respectful encounter, it is possible for two-way critical interaction and conversations to take place between religious traditions and broader culture, including constructive critiques of social, political, legal, and economic practices as they affect the family. My friends, this world meeting of families gives us a privileged opportunity to communicate the gospel of the family ad intra within the church and ad extra for the good of the church and society. In short, the good news of the family is a message of joy for the world. It is a gift for the church and for society. So I want to conclude by offering you some words from the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, where it speaks about fostering the nobility of marriage and the family. Isn't that beautiful? The nobility of marriage and the family. This is what the council said. The well-being of the individual person and of human and Christian society is intimately linked with the healthy condition of that community produced by marriage and the family. For God himself is the author of marriage, endowed as it is with various benefits and purposes. And these benefits and purposes have a very decisive bearing on the continuation of the human race, on the personal development and eternal destiny of the individual members of a family and on the dignity, stability, peace, and prosperity of the family itself and human society as a whole. My friends, I'm so conscious that Pope Francis offers us the Holy Trinity as an icon of love for our reflection during this world meeting. And so I'd like to pray with you as I began an ancient Celtic circle prayer. This time, a prayer of blessing for your family and for the family of families that is the church. The compassing, you know a compass? The compassing of God the Father be with you the circling of the God of life. The compassing of Christ be on you, the circling of the Christ of love. 
the compassing of the Spirit be on you, the circling of the Spirit of grace. May the compassing of the three, Father, Son, and Spirit, shield you this day, this night, and always. The joy of love, a joy for all God's family. The joy of love, transcending time and space. Our love for each other mirrors God the Father's love. The joy of love, a joy for all the earth. God bless you and your families. God bless you. Thank you. We have, a, we have our mascot, love it, and then we might get a bath later.